Good afternoon, Davy PhD here. I wasn't planning to post a video today, but I got up this morning, looked at Facebook, saw a statement by Douglas Ross MP, who is running to replace the recently departed Jackson Carlaw MSP as leader of the Scottish Conservatives. I quote it here before dissecting it. Let's stop dividing our country on nationalist lines and instead work together to build a better Scotland for everyone, because that's what it means to really love your country. The SNP came to power in 2007 on a pledge to govern in the interests of everyone in Scotland, and despite some early signs that this was a promise that would be kept as they sought cross-party support to get certain policies through, in reality it ushered in a decade of division for Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon recently said she did not have an anti-English bone in her body. I've never believed she does, but it's an inescapable fact that a decade and more of nationalist government has left Scotland a deeply divided country. But how could it be otherwise? It's the nature of nationalism to divide. I believe it's time to turn the page on that decade of division, and with it the nationalist chapter of Scottish history. Scotland doesn't need a party of Scottish nationalism. It needs a party of Scottish patriotism, and I intend to lead it. A properly patriotic Scottish government would ensure our education system was living up to the world-class reputation it's earned over centuries, because that's the key to a better future for all our children. It would make sure we had a justice system that dealt firmly with criminals and protected victims because the first responsibility of government is the safety of its citizens. And it would power up our economy, creating the conditions for good, well-paid jobs because everyone should be able to have the dignity of work and the security of a regular wage. The Scottish Conservative Party I lead will fight for these things because they are the patriotic things to, over, to do, to overcome the barriers that hold us back from achieving the progress we all want. Let's stop dividing our country in nationalist lines and instead work together to build a better Scotland for everyone. Because that's what it means to really love your country. Douglas Ross MP, Facebook, 2nd of August 2020. Now, Douglas Ross is quite entitled to say it how he sees it, but so am I. So Douglas, let's have a look at it point by point. It speaks volumes that you'd use the Rupert Murdoch-owned platform of a London-based newspaper to make your pitch. I'll give you credit for that one. You know your audience, and it isn't Scottish Tories. Uh, you comment that the 2007 SNP government had to seek cross-party support as if it was an option. Well, as they were a minority government, they had to. Funnily enough, they still seek it, but for some strange reason now, it seems almost impossible for your party Labour or your former party, the Liberal Democrats, to give it, whatever the issue is being discussed. Thank goodness for the pragmatism of the Scottish Greens. Keeping things moving along, you'll be delighted to hear that ScotGov hasn't given any taxpayer money to the Scottish Greens for their support, as our partners at least have a social conscience. Contrast that to the 2017 Conservative UK government who shrewdly gave up their majority to become a minority, elevating you in the process. They also had to seek support from other parties, and our memories aren't so short as to forget the grubby deal that your party made with the DUP. A billion pound bribe for the votes and support of 10 MPs for the two and a half years of that parliament. That's 40 million pounds per MP annually for the support of a party with frankly appalling views, totally at odds with a modern progressive society. And how much of that money did the DUP refund when they stopped cooperating? What was that? Oh, oh yes, you didn't get a refund at all, did you? Just like Chris Grayling didn't get a refund of any of the £14 million he gave to a ferry company who didn't actually have any ferries. On to nationalism, your general thrust is as follows. Scottish nationalism, bad. British patriotism, good. In plain language, the desire for self-determination, greater democracy, is to be sneered at and regarded as divisive. Whilst the patriotism of your party created a climate of xenophobia, put immigrants go home onto billboards and vans in the streets, emboldened fascists, fascists and created the Windrush scandal. This is apparently good nationalism, non-divisive nationalism, Respectfully, Mr Ross, I'm going to call bullshit on this. As well as being bullshit, it's also untenable. Given the Conservatives had pursued our departure from the European Union, to which the UK ceded about 10% of our sovereignty, 
And then they try to deny Scotland the same choice to leave a union to which she cedes at least 60% of her sovereignty. Where's the consistency there? Or are you only consistent when it suits you to be so? Also, didn't you actually believe in division when you voted against LGBT people being treated the same as the rest of us? And also when you were asked what your first move as Prime Minister would be, you said that you'd get tougher on gypsy travellers. That's not very diverse and inclusive now, is it? From your side, the nature of nationalism is to divide. But from mine, the nature of nationalism is to liberate. You believe it's time to turn the page on that decade of division and that Scotland doesn't need a party of Scottish nationalism. It needs one of Scottish patriotism. And you intend to lead it. Well, it may surprise you to hear that I half kind of agree with you. Despite being a loyal member and activist, I too wish Scotland didn't need a party of Scottish nationalism. But that's only possible when independence is the normal state of affairs in Scotland. And until that's secured, we continue to need a party of nationalism and patriotism. Thankfully we have one. I'm a proud member of it. We're called the SNP. You may have heard of us. I know you're ambitious, Mr Ross, as your previous membership of the sinking ship Liberal Democrat shows. When it was time to shift party, you couldn't have chosen a more polar opposite than the Conservatives. I mean, how does that happen? How does one go from being a Liberal to a Tory overnight? Was it a bang in the head? Or was it merely seeking a crack at power? I know you're not averse to switching parties to further your political ambitions, but there's only one way to lead a party. Scottish patriotism and something tells me you may not be welcome if you ever sought to join the SNP. So it kind of goes without saying that you'd never find yourself in a position to lead it. Thanks for your interest though. Education? Well we've dropped two points in two subjects in the PISA readings. Though admittedly this is not good news. It's hardly the disaster you and your chums like to make out but point taken there is work to do there. But there's so much more to education than years at secondary school. You did neglect to mention all the free preschool childcare, 590 hours, soon to be 1140 hours of free childcare per year. Not only starting the education journey earlier, but freeing up parents to return to work. Strange that never merited a mention. And what about university? You also failed to mention that one, didn't you? Free tuition as opposed to the oppressive debt foisted on our UK students. You know, the SNP government don't always get everything absolutely right. But to me, it looks like our UK has some catching up to do when it comes to levelling up education. I'm surprised to even see you think, let alone say, that the first responsibility of a government is the safety of its people. This would be laughable if it wasn't so tragic and insulting. Your party presided over the worst Covid death toll in Europe, despite having a geographic advantage and more time to prepare for it than anyone else. The UN has reported that your party chose to implement austerity measures which directly led to child poverty, food banks and the deaths of thousands of people. Your party laid off 21,000 police officers and acted like we should thank you when you recently said you'd recruit 20,000. Firstly, that's 1,000 less. And as a lot of them will be new, that's a drop in experience levels throughout the police force. It's not a good plan, is it? Contrast that with Police Scotland. More officers per capita than anywhere else in the UK. So given that track record, you'll forgive me for not trusting you or your party to keep my family, myself and my fellow citizens safe. You say you'll power up the economy. As you know only too well, the majority of the economic levers are not in Scotland's control but held at Westminster. The situation starkly laid bare during Covid. As Scott Gover unable to borrow money or have any control over furlough. On top of that, you voted in the recent trade bill to ensure that the Scottish Government would have even less control over our economic affairs. If Scotland's economy struggles, the reasons for that must naturally lie with the government with the most control. And that's yours. Mrs Thatcher's deindustrialisation strategy really powered up our economy, didn't it? I mean the UK economy is now 70% dependent on service industries. As you know, these tend to be jobs as opposed to careers. They tend to be low paid, with low worker protections, generally crappy working conditions. You know, this dependence on service industries is only increasing under Tory rule. And it's also interesting if we consider a country 
very similar to Scotland in many respects. Norway. If we'd been independent like they are in the 1970s, we could have been Norway rich right now. Norway has £160,000 in the bank in cash for everyone in the country. But with the UK in charge of our mineral wealth, we find ourselves in the position of actually being overdrawn by £33,000 for every person in the country. And finally, after 10 years in power, with the party a so-called fiscal responsibility governing, our national debt has doubled. It took 70 years to build it up, and you've doubled it in 10, simultaneously managing to improve almost nothing for anyone other than your billionaire donors. Whew. To end with, unless Michelle Ballantyne pipes up, I suspect you won't be opposed. So you'll have Ruth fill in for you and you'll plunk yourself on top of a regional list to guarantee yourself a Holyrood seat because we couldn't have you lose a constituency vote now, could we? So it's inevitable. We'll see you back in Holyrood where you'll face our First Minister who's seen off 12 UK and Scottish party leaders during her tenure. Good luck, Mr Ross. You're going to need it. Davy PhD.